Okay, everyone, welcome to Black Men Speak. I'm and I am your co-host, Tommy Duncan. It is Wednesday, May the 25th, 2022, Jimmy. And if it's Wednesday, it is Black Men Speak. And it looks like, folks, <clears throat> Jimmy may be having a, tech, a few technical difficulties here. So we will go ahead and start off the show um, this evening. And I'm sure Jimmy will be back very soon. Uh, but we do have a very special guest and a return guest at that, uh, who we will be introducing momentarily. Uh, but in the meantime, um, we will go ahead and first take out a, a few moments. And I'm pretty sure that uh, everyone is aware of the situation that happened in uh, Uvalde, Texas and South Texas. And before we even get started with our show this morning, we'd like to say, take a brief moment of silence in order to acknowledge all of those who have lost loved ones uh, during the tragic shooting in Uvalde, Texas. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would first give us 30 seconds so that we can honor those who have lost life and loved ones. Okay. We are back. So, Jimmy, you're back with us? Oh, uh, yes. I thought you guys were going. I guess I was the one that was going. Yeah, <clears throat> no problem. Things happen. You know, this technology stuff, man, uh, it, it can be a beautiful thing, but sometimes it gets in the way. So, Jimmy, I'll, sometimes. Uh, I'll let you uh, acknowledge our uh, theme music production crew. And yes. Uh, let's give a shout out to Liquid for providing our theme music. And if you haven't already, please... Uh, Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Please hit that like button and uh, spread the word. We're trying to grow the channel this year. So we appreciate all the support we have received. And we will continue to be the best and the most progressive uh, show on social media dealing with black issues. So, Tom, with that being said, why don't you introduce our guest and the topic for tonight? All right. First and foremost, uh, we would like to uh, introduce to you our special guest, uh, Professor Clarence Glover. And for those of you who have been watching us for a while, he's actually been here before uh, during the uh, the holiday season last uh, year. Um, he actually talked to us about Tis the Season to Be Free, talked about the transition um, from the end of the year to the new year, but from an African-centered perspective. But he is back. And he is our resident historian. And we're going to talk about our upcoming holiday, Memorial Day. And the theme for tonight is why historians hid the African-American origins of Memorial Day. But let's talk a little bit about Professor Glover before he gets started. During the, the latter half of the 20th century, uh, Professor Glover played a leading role in Dallas and the nation in the area of civil rights, African-American education, multicultural education, diversity harassment, and hate crime awareness. He drafted the diversity awareness harassment policy, that is, sorry, for both Southern, Method, you know, Southern Methodist University and the Dallas Independent School District. He was the director of SMU's Department of Multicultural Student Affairs, special assistant to the general superintendent of Dallas Independent School District. He is a public scholar, a minister, and a statement, statesman committed to the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy on nonviolent social change. And among many other things, he was a former Texas Juneteenth commissioner appointed by former Governor Rick Perry. He has conducted cultural diversity awareness training and lectured for the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change in Atlanta, Georgia, as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Professor Clarence Glover. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. So great to be with you again this evening. 
So folks, we're going to talk about uh, one of the uh, probably most celebrated and honored um, holidays uh, in the United States, uh, you know, possibly globally, uh, honoring our servicemen and service women who have committed their lives to the freedom of our country and the freedom of our people. But we'd like to share some things that some of you may not have known about this holiday. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about what the holiday is about and why we celebrate it. And then for some folks, some unknown facts about this holiday that you need to know. So Professor Glover, talk to us a little bit about Memorial Day, um, why we celebrate it, how we celebrate it. We see you came ready for the occasion. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. I, yes, I've come dressed up as some of the call a Buffalo soldier uh, out of our Lancaster uh, chapter where Paul Allen is our commander. Uh, and I'm wearing basically a union outfit that would have been representative of the U.S. colored troops at that time. So oftentimes you see people reenacting. And so those of us who are reenactors or who tell this story, we wear our uh, attire, as you see this evening. So we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, what is called Memorial Day, but in the African-American community, particularly uh, growing up in the countries I did, I would hear Decoration Day. Even yes. as a child, Decoration Day <clears throat> among my elders. And so as I grew and began to hear more and began to study, of course, majoring history and I'm going on and uh, doing my teaching at SMU and other things, I came to find out that Decoration Day is actually connected to the African-American soldiers who fought in the uh, Civil War on the side of the Union. So we have to put this in context. <clears throat> and so looking at the fact that we live in the South, much of this information would not be in the south, southern, in the south, if you read books, so we see that a lot of this information will be in the north. Even scholarship will be there in, in the northern area. But it happened actually in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. And I have some information. I like to read some things, if you, if I may, sure. you have historical context. Uh, one of my uh, uh, friends, uh, his name is David Blight. I like to refer to David Blight, Dr. Blight at Yale University. Who does? Uh, who has? Who's a specialist in the area of African American Southern history? I'd like to read an excerpt from his writing. Thousands of Blacks, Charlestoners, most former enslaved slave people, remained in the city and conducted a series of commemorations to declare their sense of the meaning of the war. The largest of these events, and unknown until some extraordinary luck in my recent research, took place on May 1st, 1865. During the final years of the war, the Confederates had converted the Planters House track, the Washington Race Course and Jockey Club into an outdoor prison. Union soldiers were kept in horrible conditions in the interior of the track. At least 257 died of exposure and disease and were hastily buried in a mass grave behind the grandstand. Some 28 black women went to the site, reburied the Union dead properly and built a high fence around the cemetery. They whitewashed the fence and built an archway over an entrance, which they inscribed the words martyrs of the race course. Then black Charlestonians in cooperation with white missionaries and teachers staged an unforgettable parade of 10,000 people in the slaveholders race course. The symbolic power of the low country planners aristocracy horse track where they had displayed their wealth, leisure, and influence. At 9 a.m. on May 1st, the procession stepped off, <clears throat> led by 3,000 black school children carrying armloads of roses and singing John Brown's body. The children were followed by several hundred black women with baskets of flowers. They came, black men marching in cadence, followed by contingents of Union infantry and other black and white citizens, as many as possible gathering in the cemetery enclosure, a children's choir saying, we'll rally around the flag. Following this solemn dedication, this crowd dispersed into the infield and did what many of us do on Memorial Day. They enjoyed picnics, listened to music, speeches, and watched soldiers drill. So I'm reading here to you uh, Dr. Blight's, his research, uh, re-enactment, uh, uh, re re if you will, of what happened there on May 1st in Charleston, South Carolina. And this has been kept uh, basically out of mainstream historical textbooks, of course. And so Dr. Blight has been able to uh, put this, I'd encourage your audience to, you know, Google uh, David 
W. Blight Yale University. You can get more of this information there. Uh, when we begin to look at the history of what is called the United States Color Troops, which I'm dressed as one tonight, we have to look at it in terms of its members uh, in the, some 180,000 United States Color Troops at that time. Uh, of that number, some 36,000 uh, were killed. 3,000 were, we have 36,000 would die, shall I say. 3,000 were killed and some 6,800 uh, died of disease. Okay, well, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you something now. Something that you said just struck me because I think most folks who have, you know, read the history or even listened to the history, uh, if we're talking about the Civil War, whatever context, but you just said 180,000 colored troops, correct? And, and I say that, I don't think folks really understand the context of our contribution. You said 180,000, correct? Correct. Correct. Yes. And so, we, again, we have to put it in historical context because the Emancipation Proclamation, so we put it in context and how it all happened. Uh, when we look at not freeing all the Africans, of course, they were freed only within the states within the re rebellion against the Union. But what happened during that time was that in May of 20, May 22nd, 1863, the War Department issued what is called General Order Number 143, establishing the United States Colors Troop. That's very important. This is in 1863. Understand that uh, the war ended in, eight, uh, went on to, we were last heard of in Texas in 1865. <clears throat> but, excuse me, but this is a significant turn in the battle. And that's uh, why we have to look at all these particular details of the war and the roles they played in the various battles. Now, also there is, a gentleman, some of us have seen his name was Gordon. Uh, some of us see, have seen his back, if, if I can get a picture of this. Okay, there we go. Yes, yeah, this yes. is Gordon, or some called him Peter now. He was in Louisiana, formerly enslaved and ran to Baton Rouge and joined the Union Army. This picture is a picture of his his, his, his backs having been whipped because in slavery, you, they did not kill you. They punish you because you don't want to kill your, your labor force. So they were very rarely uh lent somebody that happened after slavery but this represents him sitting down getting ready to put his uniform on and join the union army this was taken right at the time when photography became very popular and this is one of the most popular uh photographs in terms of early photography so we must see him as the beginning of an, an, an african man who sits preparing to put on his uniform to join the battle of the civil war now we have, excuse me, as I said, this event in South Carolina, which becomes Decoration Day. Then later on, there are individuals who began to reflect back on this day and say, uh, let's commemorate it in other areas, other uh, Union uh, individuals of the, in the Union Army, then later on in the Confederacy. So we see the day being moved from May 1st to what we have today, which is the end of May. But what scholars now, as Dr. Blight has uh, offered to us is that the origin of what we call Memorial Day is actually Decoration Day, which was established by African American women, particularly digging up the bodies of their former husbands or soldiers or friends and reburying them in Charleston, in South Carolina. From your perspective, and obviously this is a historical fact uh, that a lot of folks, quite frankly, don't know. What do you see as the significance? I mean, some people out there might say, well, okay, that's fine. It's Memorial Day now. So why is it so important to know? What's the big deal? Well, first of all, as I said to you, um, in our culture, I'm a proponent of Sankofa, reaching mm -hmm. back to go forward. In an African culture, this is a, from a Ghanaian tradition that says that we must have the egg in the mouth, reaching back, the feet are moving forward. Now, someone say, well, that's over in Africa. Okay, true. But this is called an adinkra. And this is the adinkra symbol. Now, many of you will see this in doors, windows in America. And this was done by many of the men in South Carolina, the blacksmith. I submit that this particular symbol was placed in America so that one day we can do what we're doing tonight, reach back into our past so that we can understand our present, you see. And so we, we, we have so many things as African-Americans that we must take responsibility for now that we are in a position to be able to construct our own narrative as you talk about your own the studio here 
being able to present our information, to create our heroes, our heroines, to have our monomyths, our, 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 the power of our story. That's so important. I'm doing right now here uh, at the African American Museum, Yanka, which connects to the Civil War. We'd like to invite you out to it. Yanka from Cinco de Mayo to uh, Juneteenth in the role of an African Maroon from Gabon influencing the Battle of Pueblo, his descendants, which influenced the Civil War. And without his presence and those warriors, when I say his descendants in that war, the Battle of Pueblo may not have been won and France would have give, would, would have um, gotten its cotton as we uh, have here. I always try to keep it near me. Cotton, which is the reason for the battle, they would have given America guns and the Confederacy may have won the war. So this is why it's important for us to tell our story, to be a, begin to un, uh, unlock all the pieces of it, no matter how it looks and uh, not just the glory, but also the gory of it and see what it means to us today, where we are. Uh, one of the things you raised in your article, in your statement, your why have historians left this out? We, we must recognize that over a period of time, particularly in the past, we were not designed to be in history, you see, the way we should have been in history. The American Teutonic Orden theory, which is what this American Historical Society builds on, says that American educational history must uh, <clears throat> present the Teutonic or the Germanic or the European story. And that's what has happened. Uh, most textbooks. Now, that since the 80s in my time, I know at SMU and DISD in particular, we have to, as a people, force the system, as we did at DISD, to have a multicultural textbook adoption process to say that we must be included. We must be present. Today, there's a battle with CRT which is really a legal graduate school, law school issue, not a public school issue. A public school issue is multicultural content. How do we teach and talk about all of us? So if we're talking about the Civil War, if we're talking about the American Revolution, if we're talking about uh, whatever it may be talking about, how are we present? We are always, we're present all the way back to the American Revolution. I'm it, it, Even when you look at George Washington crossing the Delaware, there's an African man at his knee. And it's so interesting that uh, the African-American troop that was with George Washington at the crossing of Delaware was called the Glover Regiment. The John Glover Regiment. Please look it up. And okay. you had Indians, you had African-Americans, you had a, but they were there with him. Um, my name comes from the owners from Alabama. so. We may be connected there. But my point is that we were present, not just Christmas addicts, you see, but we were present. And so Memorial Day or Decoration Day, I submit, is the day when we, just like on the Hispanic, Day of the uh, Dead, that we as African people commemorate the lives of our ancestors, particularly those in the military and others. But we would commemorate here in Dallas, Texas. I will be at the Freedman Cemetery, as I have been for the last several years, on Memorial Day, there at uh, uh, nine o'clock in the morning, placing flags and flowers, silk flowers, artificial flowers, there at our Freeman Cemetery, and invite you all to come out and be there, so that our young people can come to know our story. In your perspective, what difference do you think it would make? in our young people, in their achievement, in our schools, not just black, but white, Latin American, et cetera? Well, certainly, first of all, you, you begin with us. All cultures have a story. <clears throat> Stories are very important. And because of slavery, of course, and because of the uh, rigid way in which we were enslaved and denied our story, we must begin with that story, creating self-esteem as we said in DIZ, students' self-esteem, motivation, academic achievement are all affected by the degree in which their cultures are included within the curriculums and studies of the classroom. <clears throat> so being able to see oneself in history is so critical. Knowing what one has done, what a people have done, tells you what a people can do, okay? Also being able to have, we don't have names unlike American Indians, Asian, Hispanics. Our names, 
are not necessarily our historic own. Glover is not our name. Jones, Smith, Frank, whatever right. that last name may be. But in spite of that, there are still so many elements of our identity. Culture cannot be destroyed. It can only be transferred and transformed. So we have like electricity. We have music. We have food. We have art. We have dialect. We have language. We have everything. We are the definers of popular culture. We have been there in the battles of all of these, of all of our, in our nation, from the revolution all the way down to where we are today. Uh, we are in every component of this nation's history. Cotton is the number one component which built this nation into an industrial revolution on our backs. Every 500 pound bale of cotton, every 500 pound bale of cotton makes 100 Excuse me, every 500 pound bill of cotton makes 313,600 $100 bills. Let me say that again. Every 500 pound bill of cotton makes 313,600 $100 bills. Dallas is the mecca of the cotton industry. Dallas, uh, at the period of Civil War and then into the uh, 1900s, 20s, 30s, 40s. The largest cotton exchange. So I submit to us is that our story is the American story, but we must tell it. We must also be able to say this is why we're not where we are today because there are six basic processes for cotton, and we do all five of them: plant, chop, pick, hold, etc., gin. We did everything but sell it, and mm -hmm. in the Emancipation Proclamation and in the uh, journal order number three, particularly, it talks about both personal rights and property rights. Many talk about the four acres and a mule. Well, we must understand that was short lived. But one of the things as we go into this first national Juneteenth holiday, Ms. Opali and Ms. Dr. Myers and others who may help make possible along with uh, uh, many others, is that we must identify, and many soldiers who gave their lives and came to Galveston to help spread the word in. Uh, Juneteenth, down June 19th, is that not only is there personal rights, but there's property rights. We must now speak about our land and our cotton and how that means economics and how we're able to sustain, reclaim that today so that we can be about this. So our students are a major part of that is my point. When our students know our history, they know their place in history, then they're able to better build a, a, a more a positive future. Might you recommend um, in terms of political leverage, I mean, leverage, since this is a fact. And I mean, I actually saw this, you know, even in a, a Time Magazine article that was written a while ago, that this is actually a fact. And there are some folks, let's say if we're, if we're in Texas, we're talking about the TEA and we're talking about, you know, high school um, yes. history lessons and changing, you know, or including uh, this is some of our history books, and some might say, well, after all of this time, you know, why does it really matter? But the facts are the facts, and folks don't mind putting other facts in there. Why not this one? What does it take in terms of political leverage to change our history books? Um, let's say for our school children, because this is important information that folks do need to know. Okay, <clears throat> let me go back and preface a little bit, Thomas, if I may. Okay. I submit that the first place of our history and our culture is not in public schools. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's in our families, in our homes. I Agreed. grew up in a home where during that time, in the, uh, I'm 66, we had young men and women going around from Ebony selling books, I never shall forget, in Black America. Uh, our neighbors, my mother, our neighbors, my mother and others, we bought these books, they bought those books for us. So we must <clears throat> take a responsibility. Freedom is not free. So we must invest as parents, as adults, in our history, first of all. Make sure that there's reading material, books, technology, et cetera, around our young people. Secondly, the place I submit to you is in our church, our religious institutions. Uh, we must hold them responsible and accountable for our story, yes. Uh, Sunday school, as once was in the African American community, was not only a biblical story, but it was a political and social story. The songs of Go Down Moses, you know, did my law deliver Daniel, you know, swayed in the water. They were symbolic of both spiritual and political freedom. So we need to understand that and hold our congregations, our ministers, and so forth. And I'm a pastor as well, minister. I would agree with you. 
I, I, I would completely agree with you on that. It all starts at home. Your education. Uh, I guess a child's first education starts at home. But I have read articles that it's been a little while, but you know, after high school, I think statistically speaking, there are some folks who do not read a book at all after high school. You know, if they got a college degree, they may read one or a couple of books after that, unless it's because of their career or their professional trade. So we're talking to a lot of um, parents out there, uh, folks who have young people in their lives, and you're making, I think, very poignant suggestions. But let's be honest, you know, when it comes to our churches, unfortunately, you know, if it's not in the Bible written there in the King James Version or the Bible, typically they're not going to be talking to it in the church. And in our households, you know, most folks don't have a library. How do we begin to influence change in these areas other than telling them they need to do it? Again, um, giving you my order of home, church, I mean, home, church, school. And yes. today with technology, you don't need libraries. <laughs> you, you have computers, you have millions of books at your disposal. Uh, Correct. Controlling what the technology is conveying is the issue now. But by the time we get into yes. institutions, just as where I was at SMU and DISD and explain because of being a special assistant to the superintendent in charge of multicultural education. And now we have a lot of these individuals called diversity, equity, inclusion officers, is that we must understand that we deal with three things, philosophy, policies, and practices. Does institution have a philosophy that embraces the ideal of inclusion or diversity? Does it have policies to make sure that they're institutionalized and are there practices that they're trained in to be able to follow through on. So at DISD, when I was there in 1990s, I wrote the multicultural textbook adoption process. That was where every textbook company that came to DISD had to make sure that the books were multicultural inclusive. They started that. It impacted the nation. Well, so, well later on, and you may remember this in happening in the state again, state Texas, when the school board became more conservative, they began to gut that particular process, taking away some of this content that you've heard lately, uh, and now have added this CRT argument. So we have to be vigilant as uh, citizens to be able to articulate, understand the politics. Yes, I agree. We must be politically astute, yes. And have the types of discussion that means that when we go to the state board, going to the state board representatives of education, knowing our representative, going to the meetings, going to the committee meetings when they have it. These are the committee meetings that many people don't like to go to. It's like city council, <laughs> like even voting. We like to vote for the president, but we don't want to vote for the amendments. <laughs> you see, we'll go for right. the big stuff, but when it's smart, and it's a, all politics is local. Correct. So we, on the same page now. we have to be able to do that. So I, I'm with all three of these are necessary, you see, or essential. Because what it does when we start talking about what I call the three R's, not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but rather reconstruction, reevaluation, and redirection. This is how I teach my courses. We reconstruct the past. When we do that, we, we're going to put some new information that's not been there. Okay? It's not been there. So we have to... Put it there, it's not going to be well known, but it needs to be solid, factual. <laughs> then once we have this information, we reevaluate re re it, and then we act, redirect ourselves. Let me give you a quick example when I do my workshops. <clears throat> I simply ask the question, how many continents are there? Most people will say, how many? Seven. Seven, yeah. That's most teachers, educators. I say, seven. I ask, what is a continent, definition of a continent? Most people will say a large man, man surrounded by water. water. Then I will take a map or globe and I say, ladies and gentlemen, teachers, scholars, look at the map. Is <clears throat> Europe surrounded by water? Partially, but well, not entirely, no. So then you're, you're, no. They got, they got so Russia to the east of them. It's not, it's not, the, the concrete answer is what? No. 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 That's a concrete answer. But we call it a what? Continent. That's right. Why do we call it a continent? Because what we call the golden rule. He who has the gold wears what? <clears throat> Always a rule. That's true. Makes yeah. the rule. Okay. Unquestionably so. I have done this thousands of times across America. It's my fundamental basis of making my point here. Reconstruction means that there's a body of information that is new. So now you have what is called Euro-Asia or 
Asia and Europe, because Asia is really the large body of land, right? Yes. Europe is the appendix to Asia. That's reconstruction. Revaluation becomes, how do I think, feel about this? Redirection becomes, now how do I, what, teach this? <laughs> okay? There are many examples of like that. Uh, there's a book out, by the lies my teacher taught us, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you can look in there. These are white scholars who, now many white scholars who are aware of this as well as African-American scholars. Uh, there's a book even for this evening I'd like to recommend is by uh, William A. Dobar, D-O-B-A-R, William A. D-O-B-A-R. And the book is entitled uh, Freedom by the Sword, U.S. Colored Troops from 1862 to 1867, William A. Dobar. So when we allow ourselves to inform with some information today, then we're able to be in a better position to present it to school boards and others and uh, defend our arguments. Why don't we do this, Timmy? Um, we agreed that halfway through the show that we would uh, play a memorial for our listeners, and I think we are right about that time, Jimmy. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and play that video clip, honoring our black soldiers. I love that, Jimmy. Thank you so much for finding that. Back. Like to like to kind of broaden the discussion, and, and I don't want to get way off base here, but you know, when I look at that video and I look at the annals of history and the significance of our servicemen and service women, black men and black women, and how they have shaped uh, armed conflict in this country uh, from the Civil War. Uh, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, and we we have this Memorial Day celebration. You know, we call it a holiday, but we look at how we honor our service men and our service women and our black ones in particular, and how they shaped history. What are your thoughts to our young people, um, to our senior citizens, even to those who have served on the importance of this day, um, and those who have served in general? How should we continue to narrate and honor these folks? And why is it so important in the context of what we're talking here today? First of all, let me say, uh, uh, what a pre excellent piece, excellent. And yes. to, including the African-American women, excellent. Right. Harriet, Harriet Tubman, who was one of the leading uh, uh, spies during the Civil War, yeah. Uh, yeah. during her lifetime, not only helping people to escape, but served during her lifetime. Um, <clears throat> first of all, being a minister as an educator, it's not a holiday. We should always remember these are start, these are, should be holy days. The word is originally a holy day. Uh, we've made of it a hollow, sometimes a hollow, we call it empty day, and into a yeah. commercial, commercial day, you know, commercializing, you know, buy this, buy that, etc. So first, it should be a holy time, a sacred time. And I believe that we as African-American men and women must begin to create more moments of sacred time in our personal lives. Uh, those of us who are now 60, you know, I'm a senior citizen, you know, we have our parents now who are in the 80s. Uh, you know, we must, you know, take some of those moments and remember how they created those sacred moments for us, be they in the church, in the cemetery, be they wherever they are. It's like laying the reef at the unknown soldier. All of us, all cultures must have their holy spaces and holy times, just as in the uh, Hebrew traditions of which many of us are part of, are out of, 
when we look at our freedom coming out of um, uh, Egypt, your story, why is this night so different from any other night? Because it's the night that Yahweh our God delivered us from, from bondage. Why is December 31st watch freedom night different from any other night? Why is uh, Juneteenth different from any other day? We must begin to articulate these. They must see us act out, live out these spiritual, social moments, particularly as men. As men, unlike women, we we are not, I submit to you, that's why even in most faiths, you see the men being brought in to be uh, disciples or disciplined. Women tend to have a natural, innate sense of spirituality, uh, an understanding of humility and humbleness, uh, sacrificial of blood, monthly, etc. cetera, uh, that humbles and makes them aware. Men, are, we're not like that. So we go out and we make sacrifice. We kill, we <laughs> make blood. And so subsequently, we have to be brought into that whole issue of sacrifice and submission. I believe that today as African men, black men, one of the most, one of the greatest things we can do is begin to do that so our boys can see us, understand that. Uh, I had a call, so I just, uh, see my, my brother <laughs> who was in the military, uh, thank you Larry, uh, talked about single mothers and others and how to get these stories out to our young people. Well, just like Dr. Uh, Carson, whose mother, single mother, uh, made them read books and she couldn't read very well. Right. But she held them accountable. Yes. She held them accountable. So tonight I commend you. I commend you because <clears throat> I've been so concerned about us having our own mediums, our own stations to convey Thank our you. information. And those of us who are educators who spent years trying to do to have places to come. When I was coming up, Tony Brown, who was a good friend yeah. of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah brother. And, 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 and so he had the Tony Brown Journal. We would yes. talk often. Uh, and I, I, I admire him so much, you see. And I commend you to him. I mean, that'd be like tonight. But how many of my young brothers know Tony Brown? I didn't even hear his name, you know? I don't want to yeah. black, I don't, I don't want, I don't want the black, I don't want the white, I just want the truth, you see? <laughs> That's what Tony would say. Let me let me go back to something and, and make sure we don't miss this. And you made a, a very powerful statement. You know, in the country, you know, we, we talk about holiday and you, you talk about families to getting together. You typically talking about food and spending some money. But you talked about Holy Day, which is very Holy important. Day. The question is, and I want you to kind of keep this practical for folks who, OK, what does that mean? Go to church. If we're talking about celebrating what people traditionally talk about as a holiday, and we look at the holiday, that's a completely different framework and context. What does that mean to me as an individual? What does that mean to our family? And what should be, we be doing if we're talking about this as a holy day, even a Memorial Day, whatever it is? Well, I, I submit to you, and being a liberation theologian in my background, I'm going to submit to you that when we start talking about holiday, holiday or spirituality, we have to rid ourselves of imagery. Because so many African American men, in particular, the idea that God is a white man on the wall and somehow we have to worship that image has stunted our ability to really be committed to, particularly the church, if you will. Uh, the Christian faith, which is an evolution of doctrines out of the Roman uh, Constantine and uh, the Council of Nicaea, many young men and women, many individuals know that. I know, and I've been talking about it for years in Essence Magazine. I did an article on spirituality and African view and, and cautioned men and men, our ministers that we have to catch up with the research. So when we start talking about a holiday, a holiday for African people, it cannot it cannot include a white image, first of all. It must include a spiritual principle. <laughs> spiritual principles. Because that particular concept that we traditionally we've had in our homes of the image of the uh, Lord's Supper, Jesus on the wall, Martin Luther King, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. All of those in the church, oh, the, the Baptist, all of that's in our minds at certain generation, you see. And liberation theology, my bishop, Bishop Joseph Johnson, and others, Caesar Claw, I mean, uh, 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 James Cohn, and others, uh, Jacqueline Grant, we all began to say, we, we, we cannot, the, the most, my point to you is that the most racist symbol in America is a white Jesus. Now, that said, we, have to see God in a spiritual context. Even the Messiah said, God is a spirit and they who worship God 
must worship God in spirit and in truth. So as a people who are trying to find the proper spiritual path, so be you Muslim, we, but we understand the Muslim faith, the Hindu faith, but I'm speaking specifically about those who have fallen away from the church, if you will, where the majority of our people were at once time. We have to construct a spiritual paradigm that embraces a, 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 a spiritual image and not a physical image so that people are able to enter to a place of holiness, particularly men, particularly men. And ministers must also practice that because we must bring men, if they choose to, come back into the church and find that place where they can create spiritual ritual for their families, for their children, for themselves, but without being limited by this image that in and of itself um, negates their identity. So what, what should we be doing differently? What, what, let's say that mother, that father, that family, what would your maybe general, some thoughts, small, large, uh, in terms of, let's say we're talking about Memorial Day this weekend. What are some things that you might have them consider doing this First weekend? First of all, simply going to the cemetery. Yes, going to the cemeteries. Going to the cemetery, Freeman Cemetery, other cemeteries, uh, and be able to go there and explain the reasons why. Because there are men and women who gave their lives, who are African-Americans, who gave their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy today. So that as we go there, if you have worship services, if you will, that uh, you acknowledge those individuals who gave their lives uh, for us to have the rights and freedoms we have today. Uh, that's an all faith tradition, be it Muslim, whatever, Yoruba, et cetera and begin to acknowledge it. Honoring our ancestors. Correct. And those, and so, particularly in this case, those who gave their lives in the uh, process of freedom for our nation. And by the way, I would be remiss uh, if I did not say, are you going to be doing anything specific? I understand we have people who may be listening from around the country, but since you're in the DFW area, do you have anything going on on Memorial Day that you might want to share with us that folks might want to participate in? I will be at the Freeman Cemetery on Lemon and Central Expressway at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. I have been with that cemetery since the eighties and now it has become a monument, beautiful monument. But um, I also know where the original grave is out there. The only one that's left, which I will be uh, going to. Uh, I know where the hundreds of thousands of bodies are actually buried. Uh, many people don't. I will be going there. Well, now there's a market there, but it has not been known. So I'll be I'll be sharing history, and we will be doing libations and having our drums, like the song that was raised, uh, saying um, years years ago, um, um, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which was written uh, as a result of the Civil War and African American fighters, and uh, uh, glory, glory, excuse me, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. So we'll be doing these songs at the cemetery and remembering our, our, our not just our ancestors, but our soldiers as well. Absolutely. So just for folks out there who may have missed that, we want to uh, oh and thank uh, Edward Willis for uh, joining us tonight. We know there's some other folks out there. The chat line is open. The uh, <clears throat> line is open if you want to call in. So uh, this Sunday, not on Monday, but on Sunday at 9 a.m. at the- Freeman Cemetery. Freedman Cemetery. If you're in the yeah. DFW area, that's on Lemon and Central at 9 a.m. You're across from the Walmart. Okay. And for other folks who may not be in the DFW area and they're not aware of whether they're not aware of whether they have something similar to that in their area, any thoughts or recommendations for them if they don't have anything comparable to that in their area? Maybe they live in a smaller rural area or even the larger city, they just don't know where their comparable would be. What might you recommend they could do? Okay. <clears throat> Again I, again, I speak to cemeteries, rural or larger cities. Okay. Uh, cemeteries are important. I grew up in the cemetery. Literally, I, my great-grandparents, we clean our cemetery off. Uh, cemeteries are a very sacred place. But somehow we've gotten away from them in terms of going there on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. so I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just say if you can find one somewhere near, and if you can't find a cemetery that's near, then find it's a park or somewhere and gather, call the names, remember them, pour libations, offer, <clears throat> offer prayers, if you will, singing songs to battle him of the Republic, 
glory, glory, hallelujah, since I've laid my burdens down. You see, that's said about him in the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And so, you know, glory, glory, hallelujah says, uh, you know, since I've laid my burdens down, that's that victory, I, the war is over. There are many, get out oh, and get with your ancestors. The and, so, and, so, and so if I'm hearing you correctly, and I want to make sure I'm understanding this too as well, even if it's not a military cemetery, even if you don't know specifically where your loved one is who may have served in some capacity, going to a cemetery is symbolic and you can still go through the ritual of honoring our ancestors, honoring those who have served in that environment, even if you don't know specifically where that person Let is. Let me just say this. In my home, as a pastor First African Freedom Church, we have altars. I would encourage every home to have an altar, a place where you pray, a place where you light your incense, a place where you light your candles, a place where you place the pictures of ancestors, a place where you place the pictures of people who you can cut out magazines like Harriet of books and place on your altar. Uh, and particularly as men, I'm say to you as men tonight, call the family to prayer. African-American men, call your family to prayer. Men, call your family to prayer. When we as men began that process of submitting ourselves and calling our families and our particularly to prayer, when they see us humbling ourselves before a creator. And as I often tell ladies, and particularly when I'm counseling marriage, I said, yeah, be careful who you marry, because if you marry a man who's not submitted to God, he may hurt you. Uh, we must humble ourselves. Men have an energy that must be submitted to God. And so start in your home or in your backyard. Spirit is everywhere. It is not exclusive. Correct. And also, we want to thank uh, Enclave Patriot for joining us. Uh, Cliff Notes, she loves your cavalry uniform. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> are, there so any you know. are there any questions uh, that they may have? Uh, not a specific question right now. They, uh, we have uh, Edward Willis, who is acknowledging um, someone who has served. And then we have Enclave Patriot, as, uh, someone she is a descendant of a Confederate soldier. She says, I love your cavalry uniform. And my brother who's listening, he's up in Washington, D.C. He's a former uh, naval officer, and he's texting me here. So uh, Larry Wald, my brother, thank you so much for listening. Uh, but Absolutely. So creating an altar, going to a, a cemetery, honoring your ancestors, honoring those who have served, um, creating an altar in your home, whatever that may be. And um, then also texting. Let me say this. <clears throat> this is what... There's so much research. I've given you one book this yeah. evening uh, by William A. Dubois, uh, Freedom by the Sword. I've mm -hmm. given you Dr. Uh, David Blight from Yale University. You can pull this information up and begin to read it this weekend. Study it, you see. Study it. And as we study it, we begin to, uh, like food, it becomes a part of us, you know. A mm -hmm. part that no one can take from you. That's correct. And then we began to share it. Sunday mornings, my ministers, my brothers out there, let me challenge them out there. My brothers who are ministers, please hear me tonight. It is our responsibility. If you are a minister and your professed call is to, particularly to the church of which I've grown up in, we owe it to our congregation, we owe it to our people mm -hmm. to become more informed, more aware, knowledgeable about our history, even in the biblical sense. The Church of Israel, the Hebrews, down in Egypt. The Bible is a book of color. That's just a fact of what it is before it becomes a Gentile story over in the New Testament with Paul. So we began, that's how we in the past connected to that Bible. Did my law deliver Daniel? Three Hebrew yeah. boys. Swing low, sweet chariot. Harriet, you see. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? You know, a band of angels coming after me. Wade in the water. You know, look like a band that Moses led. These mm -hmm. are our songs. These are our stories that are wrapped into the biblical experience. So I submit to you tonight that when we embrace that, we can begin to 
feed on that and become the man that we should be. Correct. I agree with you, brother. Yes. And so as ministers and men who are in every African man who's listening tonight, I hold you to task on that. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Glover. And we are probably within 10 minutes of the uh, close of our show. And I want to thank you uh, for everything that uh, you have shared with us thus far. So we'll probably um, maybe give it another five or so minutes and then we will close with your, with uh, prayer, which of course um, we will uh, have you to present for us uh, at the close of our show. Jimmy, uh, we appreciate you. You've been kind of working with the production side of it. Any, any thoughts or questions uh, that you'd like to uh, put out there uh, as we uh, close out this evening's show? No, I, I appreciate Brother Glover put the challenge out there. We need to hold ourselves, black men, more accountable uh, for our condition. And we have to lead. We can't follow. So I appreciate you. And I thank you, uh, Brother Glover, for putting it out there. Uh, not very many ministers have the courage that you just displayed on this show tonight. So uh, so we appreciate and you. You're always, you're always a great guest. I always learn so much when uh, you come on. So you know, we love having you on. And uh, you're welcome to come back anytime you want to. Thank you. I want to commend again both of you for creating a quality show. We as I look at the view, I look at real, I look at these shows of women and and sisters of color doing their thing. Um, I have not found places like this, and uh, it is something that's so badly needed in so many topics to be discussed as as African men. And I will submit to you, Africa men from Africa. We must bring our brothers from Nigeria, from Ghana on and talk with them so that we can bridge an into, you know, stop we talking do. about Pan-Africanism and be Pan-African. Right. You know, we must create a back and forth connection because even after the Civil War, when Liberia was established to carry Africans back, that's where my family went back to uh, Liberia and went back to Ghana and okay. to both, both the regions. And I've been to the House of Glover in Accra, Ghana. Wow. So we have a church there in, in Ghana. So, in Bono, so we... We as African men of the diaspora must, we, we are in that season, we are in the season of Sankofa. Uh, I submit to you, this is our season. The symbols are everywhere. Once you see this, you now know what the men during that time in Carolina, they were saying to us, it's time now. Time. It's time. And it's iron, it can't be bent. Once put in shape, unless you put it into a fiery furnace, it is permanently here. This symbol is all over America. And I submit to you, it was created by African men to prepare us for this very season that we're in now. Outstanding. Well, Professor Glover, we appreciate your time this evening. We appreciate the, the history, yes. the insight, the theory, and the power that you have projected during this show today. Uh, you know, on Black Men Speak, we aspire to provide information content uh, that will inspire people to understand and learn our history and our culture so that we can be empowered as a community of people. And the only way we can do that is to have folks like yourself as collaborators so we can get this out. As Jimmy has said so many times, you know, we are in a, a position in time where this will be a permanent annal of history. And so we are so honored to have you. Yes, we are. honored to be here. And I want to say that, um, I want to encourage you to go to the African American Museum and see this uh, exhibit of Yanka by the yeah. Latin uh, Arts Project. I have tell, also tell, been, tell us, uh, in, in short order, tell us a little bit about that, and I think that will give us enough time to close everything out after that. Yes, <clears throat> Yanka again was the maroon warrior from Gabon. Uh, I have an article is on is on Dallas Examiner online called Yanka from Cinco de Mayo to Juneteenth, and it's the story of the maroons. And a maroon is a African settlement of Africans who rebelled against slavery. And Yonka was the first person in his settlement to be a free settlement in the Americas in the new, in, under New Spain. So he's the first liberator in the Americas. There's an exhibit there. But the Battle of Puebla, Cinco de Mayo, which were, <clears throat> which the, uh, if you go and pull up the reenactment of Cinco de Mayo, you will see the black face uh, straw hat individual with machetes who were descendants of the, because Pueblo and uh, Vera, Yanka, Veracruz are right next to each other. They beat the French on 
May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, which gave a delay and opportunity for the Union Army to regroup. France was about to sell weapons to America in exchange for cotton, again, cotton. But because of that battle, they were not able to do so. So subsequently, they were able to regroup in America, but they did lose later uh, at the, Fran uh, the uh, Franco-Mexican War. But that battle was essential to Juneteenth later in history, which is now where we are today. So <clears throat> it is at the museum. Uh, please go see it. Pull my article up online, Yanka, from Cinco de Mayo to Juneteenth under the Dallas Examiner newspaper. And I will be going back there very soon. I do, I've done one class. I'll be doing another class very soon. And also we are planning to take Mother uh, Opal Lee there, my, um, of which I serve as an advice to her and work with her so that she can see the exhibit as well. And we want people to see it uh, throughout. The, it'll be into October, by the way. And by the way, oh, this coming uh, Sunday at the African American Museum, City Men Speak. I mean, City Men Cook will be there. I'll be there early on with City Men Cook. And you can see the exhibit there this Sunday uh, as well as City Men Cook. And then later on that evening, excuse me, <clears throat> I will, I've been speaking so much this week. But no problem. Later on, I will be at the uh, Miss Marty uh, Bar, the Freedom Farm in Hutchins, between three and eight, and we'll be doing free, drums of freedom at the Freedom Farm, Marty Berry's Freedom Farm in Hutchins. Uh, Linda Henderson, who owns Henderson's Chicken, is sponsoring that, and she and her mother, and I'll be there speaking uh, that afternoon. <clears throat> All right. Well, in that case, uh, I think, Jimmy, uh, without further ado, I believe that closes out our hour uh, for this evening's show. Uh, we want to thank you again, Professor Glover, for honoring us with your presence, your thoughts, and your knowledge to share with our listeners today. Um, of course, we want to uh, welcome you back um, so that we can continue this dialogue uh, over time. And as always, Jimmy, unless there is something else you'd like to share, we will close with a word of prayer. Jim, is there anything else before we close with a word of prayer? No, I think our brother Glover said it all. So all know, right. please come back. Uh, let's, yeah, let's close out with a prayer. That's how we do it all here. Right. Professor Glover, I will share the honors with you. Go ahead. Father, Mother God, we give you thanks this evening for this blessed opportunity, for this holy time, this holy hour, as we began to enter to this season of remembrance. May we be mindful of those who have come before us. May we be mindful of those men and women who gave their lives throughout the this history, history of this nation, that we might have the right to the tree of life and liberty. May we who embrace freedom today know and understand that freedom is never won once or forever, that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance and the people who cannot preserve freedom ultimately do not deserve freedom. Let us know our responsibility as men as we call our families and our communities to, to prayer Humble us before you that we might do your will in your world, that we might put our faith to feed and our prayers to practice. And we'll be so careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise for this in your holy name that we ask it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for joining us tonight.